Welcome. My name is Susan Downs and this handsome gentleman uh, to the side of me is Stephen Fox. He's a genius. And the gentleman next to him is Anthony Haynes. We are the Silicon Valley Health Institute where we bring leading edge health information with some of the world's experts so we can be more proactive in our health and move on the path of optimal wellness. We are a nonprofit organization. Uh, so if you wanna donate or you wanna join, if you wanna be on our email list, uh, you can go to our website, it's Silicon Valley Health Institute. That's S V as in Victor, H is in health, I is in institute. Anyway, we've got uh, decades of archive videos with world leading experts. Today, we're lucky to have Anthony Haynes, one of my favorites. He's gonna talk about sarcopenia, which is muscle loss, how that affects us and what we can do to make our health better. Anthony's been in practice for over 25 years and is one of the most experienced registered nutritionists in the UK. He's one of the first practitioners to implement the principles of functional medicine in the UK, starting in 1994. He's been teaching for 25 years, including a variety of nutritional colleges, ION, CNELM, BCNH, CNM, and at the Institute for Functional Medicine in the USA, as well as for Neutralink, a company he co-founded in 1998 with uh, Dr. Ash. He's presented lectures, seminars, and courses on a wide variety of subjects over those years. In particular, he's been studying the connection between viruses and bacteria and their role in the pathogenesis of immune conditions. He's known as the practitioner's practitioner, and I'm a practitioner and he's my practitioner, so I'll vouch for that. He employs his clinical experience in managing the nutritional needs of his patients, which number in the excess of 15,000 at his clinic. The nutrition clinic um, in UK is his clinic, and he is a, a successful award-winning author of at least two books on nutrition. So Anthony, we're so happy to have you here and welcome. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, Stephen. Pleasure to be here again um, with, uh, I can see some of the names are, and some of the images. I, I've seen that Golden Gate Bridge before, um, but pleasure to see you and I'm waving hello at, um, at the folk that I know. Thank you very much Steve, for tuning in. And if you listen to this later um, than the date, uh, welcome to you as well. So today the subject, the subject, it doesn't sound very, dare I say, it doesn't sound very sexy, sarcopenia. Sarcopenia, what is sarcopenia? So I'll talk about that. But I, I'm going to start today with some rhetorical questions on the first hand, and then I've got a quiz. So we've got, uh, get from the get-go, to keep you utterly enthralled in the whole process is to engage your brains um, with a quiz. So rhetorically, I've got these questions. So what do you do? This is not really for you to, to share with us, but just have you think. What do you do on a daily basis for your health today that you know that you're going to benefit from in the future as you dare i say it get older so that's my first question what are you doing today and uh, is it all for today or is it all for today and tomorrow that's question number one no number two how much of your daily health regimen if that's a thing is designed to give you a reward for today and um, how much is designed to give you a reward for tomorrow so i've separated the question out so how much are you doing in your overall health uh, for the future and how much of your daily regimen is helping you feel good today and how much is specifically designed for future health. Um, number three, a perhaps a disconnected question, but how much and do you have any concern and what do you do um, specifically to strengthen your bone health? Hmm. I guess I take vitamin D, Anthony, would be one response. And then my last rhetorical question is, um, do you wish, of course, it's a simple thing, do you wish to remain independent for as long as you can until the final moment of life? Or, or the other opposite would be, do you, are you going to envisage yourself being dependent on others? And so we lead into the conversation on sarcopenia with those questions. So, you know, what do we do? And then I've got a quiz. So we start with a quiz. Um, so in what year, in what year, um, was the word sarcopenia first used as far as as far as we can tell what year so it's a, it's a guess and maybe somebody used it beforehand but the information I'm getting what year was sarcopenia first used and the second question is what year was the first scientific paper published with the word sarcopenia in it so it gives us a sense of perspective and we are certainly creatures of the modern age because it is actually not that far away um, so num number two which tissue in the body uh, nourishes or has the capacity to nourish every other tissue in the body? That's question number two. 
what tissue in the body has nourishes or has the capacity to nourish every other tissue in the body, which, which tissue is that? Question number three in the quiz. <clears throat> I think Stephen is fast thinking about what the prize can be for someone who gets all these answers right. Um, what percentage of people, um, and it varies, so what, what band of percentage have the studies shown um, uh, of the people that have sarcopenia? So how many people, what percentage of people have sarcopenia? And studies, of course, depending on what they're looking at. So it's a range of percentages. So this percentage is this percentage actually have this thing called sarcopenia, which I'm gonna be talking about and explaining a bit more about. That's question number three. Question number four, very interesting question. This is, this is great. Uh, and there could be more than one answer, but here's, here's what I've got. Here's, what is more dangerous than smoking and kills more people than HIV and is more treacherous than parachuting? Hmm. So answers, answers uh, not, on, not on an email, not on a postcard, but on your piece of paper um, on your desk. What is more dangerous than smoking, kills more people than HIV, and is more treacherous than parachuting? <gasps> what can that be? And the fifth question out of five um, is, how much protein do you eat every day? How much protein do you eat every day? How much protein do you eat every day? You need to put the figure in grams. I guess ounces, ounces or grams, that'd be, that'd be great. Although the translation from ounces and grams probably needs a bit of a calculator for my part. So thank you very much indeed for engaging in a sort of rhetorical questioning. Like, what do I do every day? Am I doing it for today? Am I doing it for tomorrow? So how much are we engaging in health? Um, it's just trying to make, make this whole process and conversation about sarcopenia relevant. So let's let's dive in. So what is, what is sarcopenia? How does it affect you? What's the prevalence? Um, and what can it lead to? What does sarcopenia lead to? And how is it assessed? And also what can we do to prevent it uh, in the sense I'm definitely for an ounce of prevention versus uh, the pound or pounds of cure it might take once I've got it or we've got it. Um, and so that's that's hopefully the learning outcomes for today. I'm going to share my screen just for one moment uh, later on, but um, I'll share that later. So thanks so much for your engagement. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you and I appreciate it's a different time. It's now it's now about a 10 past five GMT in UK time. So I've, I've I sort of had my day. Um, although most days seem to be about the same nowadays and it's sort of like Groundhog Day. I think we've all had that, that experience. So sarcopenia. So now my brother, and you share this with you, I haven't shared this with this lovely audience before. My brother teaches Latin and Greek. Um, you must think about, he's got so many opportunities for work. I think there are 13, um, no, is it 30? 30 public schools, that's the private schools in England, the 30 public schools where they have this uh, teaching, teaching posts. So he studied classics at Cambridge University in England and, in, and, and, and teaches Latin and Greek. So he would know exactly what sarcopenia means. Now, sarc means flesh in Greek and penia means poverty. So it's a poverty of flesh. So it's a lack of muscle. And so sarcopenia is just that. As we age, it's a normal thing for us to lose skeletal muscle mass. So skeletal muscle mass, not the smooth muscle mass, but the muscles, I guess you could see and feel in your legs and arms and back and chest and so on. And they estimate that it's about 0.5, scary as you use this, 0.5 to 1% loss per year after the age of 50. So the quality of the muscle diminishes and also strength um, diminishes as well. So we'll talk about strength uh, and so on. So it's a loss of muscle mass and strength with age and it's becoming recognized as a major cause of disability and morbidity as we get older. So today it's not very sexy in the same way prevention is much less sexy than curing or saving the world with something in the immediate here and now. But it really is uh, an absolutely vital phenomenon. And what got me into the subject to begin with was hearing of a study. Can I find it? I can't find it. But the study was a 20 year study. So it was uh, decades long and it was an assessment of 40 year olds of men and women. And they assessed every aspect of their health they could do in terms of smoking. Are you your own boss? Uh, are you working for somebody else? Have you got stress in your life? Are, what's your weight? What's your height? Uh, what other habits you do? What's your alcohol intake? You know, the usual questions you ask about lifestyle and diet and health. And they, they mapped them and they followed these individuals over 20 years. And they broke uh, after 20 years, they finished the study and they, their aim was what variables at the age of 40 and, 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 and onwards are the most important to determine morbidity, so the, the, or the absence of ill health or diagnosis of a disease and death. Now, some people die during that time as they would do in a large, um, large um, host of, of participants. And they discovered that the single most important factor that determined the well-being 
and lack of morbidity in this group of adults was the muscle mass they had at 40, um, including smoking, stress, et cetera, et cetera, which all played a role. But it was, I was just fascinated, just, just absolutely amazed at that time, discovered, wow, lean muscle mass at 40 is the single biggest determinant. Um, and of course, for men, men tend to have bigger muscles and get to be stronger, obviously, than, than women. Um, and it's sort of, although it's very, very common now for us to engage in exercise, it really does highlight the importance of keeping strong and uh, to be well. So it's interesting. So, well, that's all and well, but let's have a look at what sarcopenia um, sort of does and what it leads to. So sarcopenia is a, is a part of what's called the frailty syndrome. And we've learned all about that with this recent uh, viral situation is that the, it's the old folk with comorbidities that are most likely to have a negative in, impact from any virus, including this SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it's a, it's, it's a really important factor. So lack of muscle mass, um, it can be independent of this thing called cachexia, which is a sort of more rapid muscle weight loss with, with often associated with cancer, um, where actually you don't have to have malaise or other issues. It simply could be, it's, it's, sarcopenia can exist on its own and you can have no other diagnoses. And what's fascinating in the literature, I love this quote, uh, well, I'm not sure if you'll love it, but it's uh, sarcopenia has been referred to as a geriatric, giant which i quite i quite like i thought the uh, the imagination of the scientists creating that term is, is fantastic it is geriatric giant now we're all growing older we're all getting older i don't know what the average age is of, of, of the viewers but i guess we're over 21 now although i feel younger than that still on occasion but uh, let, let's see if we can get away so the answer to the first quick quiz what year was the term sarcopenia uh, first quoted or used it was introduced in 1989 1989 it was it was first by Dr. Rosenberg, apparently. Um, and in the first study that actually in the science of literature in PubMed that I could find was 1999. So full 10 years later, the first study on sarcopenia. So it's quite fresh, but actually it's been happening throughout human existence where we've been losing muscle mass. So the, uh, the advent of this term has contributed to the focus uh, on the condition. If you name it, name something, it can then be focused on and it affects the quality of life and the care, certainly as we get older. Now, there are effective means of helping to resolve this, which I'll, I'll talk about after we've covered a bit more information. Now, I discovered in the research about, about this condition that there are, there, are, there are working groups all over the world. There's an international working group, there's an Asian working group, there's an American working group, there's a European working group on sarcopenia. So these are, these are some, sometimes full-time employees and research professionals and, and uh, PhDs and MDs, um, and, they, and they dedicate their whole time to looking at, at that subject. So in 1999 was the first study. And then, then and I'm a, I looked yesterday um, for the PubMed and guess how many articles uh, contain the word sarcopenia on PubMed. It's 20 and a half thousand. Um, so there's lots of data, lots of information about it. A lot of the information is talking about it and about how to assess it. It doesn't necessarily help, help you in terms of identifying what to do about it. Now, to answer another question, what percentage of the population have sarcopenia depending on the studies and of course, depending on the age group? But 65 and older, um, the age groups, depending around the world, depending where we live and whether we're in Japan or, or America and England and so on, is 21 to 33 percent of the population over 65. Now, because uh, I'm, I'm 55 myself, but I guess some of us are actually closer to 65. It's like, oh, so 21 to 33 uh, percent. So sarcopenia, well, bear in mind the impact this is going to have. So it's associated with morbidity and premature mortality and is linked to disability to falls, to fractures, to poor quality of life, to depression and hospitalization as well. And there's also a massive increased cost of medically if one's had surgery and or post-op complications as a result of having that surgery. Oh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a massive issue. When I looked at the figures, the, these different various groups, they quote, and I know I appreciate we were in an amazing time. It's an amazing time to be alive, let's face it. In terms of the trillions uh, to, to for the for that that's been created or reprinted in the world, so nowadays we, we're sort of like a blur. But it it costs billions and billions of yen in Japan, it costs billions of pounds in England, it costs billions of dollars in America, and billions of euros in Europe. It costs billions. This this sarcopenia condition, it's completely in our control, and everybody has the capacity to to do something about it. It's not like oh bad luck on the gene front, you chose the wrong parents. 
it was one that's bad that oh you're exposed to environmental toxins i'm sorry couldn't do anything about that etc we all have the capacity to do something about it this is so, so wonderful so it really is it's to the people we can't have government guidelines because the government guidelines are saying we should move more and we should eat more healthily but that hasn't really worked and so sarcopenia rates are increasing and and significant so what's the quick what's the answer to the question what's more dangerous than smoking and kills more people than HIV and apparently it's more treacherous than parachuting. Now, I don't know about you, but I did some parachute training. I think it's one of those must. Uh, I was doing parachute training, but it was so cloudy. We could, we didn't, we sort of went up in the air and we couldn't jump because it was too cloudy because it was a fixed rope uh, parachute jump in the first instance. So I didn't do, I wasn't supported by somebody on skydiving. We ended up the next day, next day. So on four occasions, I tried to get a bit as cloudy. England is cloudy. And I never got to do the jump. So I did a little training. So a bit of a disappointment. So I could have I could have had this experience. So what is it that's more dangerous? And I'm going to tell you now. It is, it is sitting. I know. Oh God, oh my God. It's sitting. It's sit sitting is more dangerous. So the couch or the sofa in England, it's called the sofa or the couch. Is, and possibly the, the chair and I don't know about you but I've, I've, I've tried standing up at a desk and I've got an elevated desk and, and I like, gosh that is tiring I thought I was fit I'm fit for something but so getting used to that on a day-by-day -day basis and, and increasing the numbers of hours is very useful indeed and it seems that the uh, workout at the end of the day does not compensate um, and uh, I can't, I, I thank you for the comment in the chat box. Um, yes, what's more dangerous? Um, and actually, we can think of other things. Like I said, there's not no one answer, but I suspect that, um, yes, the government, not our government, but the government um, is more dangerous than everything all put together. And clearly it's manifesting in that way too. I hope that's not too radical a statement, but sitting. So if we sit and acquiesce, maybe maybe sit and acquiesce, if we acquiesce to what's going on, that will be even more dangerous for us than if we sat and took action. But sitting and so movement, very important indeed. If we think about the numbers of hours, I looked at the, um, had the great pleasure of looking at Dr. Paul Clayton's uh, research work with a colleague of his, looking at uh, the number of hours that the Victorian folk in England, London, spent uh, in physical activity in the day. And it was 16 hours of on their feet, on the go activity. Pictures of the Victorian families, quite large numbers. Um, and all lean. There was not one overweight individual in these photographs of Victorian folk, 16 hours on the day, and the calories they burned, unbelievable, no refrigeration, so just eating an awful lot of food and all lean, so the phys physical activity, so things have greatly changed since that time. So, um, and, um, and how much protein do you eat each day? We're going to come on to that. So, sarcopenia is the lack of loss of muscle as we get older. Um, and it greatly diminishes independence and quality of life. It reduces individual health and happiness on a societal level. Uh, it increases the risk of all cause mortality and disability. And it puts every patient who's got uh, um, surgery at risk of further complications. And that has a massive financial impact on society, quite apart from individual families. And I understand different health, health um, services in different countries cost different amounts. Um, so how do you measure sarcopenia? How do you know what it is? And so the, I'll talk about, about how the methods of assessment. So there are various tools. And so we've got tools that we can use in a, in a hospital setting. So it's an MRI scan, it's a CT scan, it's a DEXA scan. And that, that means going there and having those tests done to actually look at the amount of muscle mass we've got. Now that's, that becomes quite challenging. So there are much, much more simple methods of determining whether we are there or not. Anthony, have I got sarcopenia? You know, it's not the question I've ever been asked, but I'm sort of like, you know, how, how do I know if I've got it? And the answer is common sense. I think if we could see each other walk into the room, we could probably have a guess of whether someone is likely to have this loss of muscle mass or not. And certainly if we're on the beach, I guess we could see our bodies more clearly and then we could tell with greater accuracy as to whether that person was indeed sarcopenic or lacking muscle mass. And typically as we get older, we do, we do lose uh, muscle mass. So I'll share with you a goal I had. I don't know if, you, if this has crossed your mind and whether it's just a just someone like me involved in health. But I, I sort of vowed, I, I'm 55 and I, and I vowed at 50, lots of things at 50. Oh, beginning with F as well. I thought, oh, I'm 50 years old. Um, I, think, I think the first intimations of mortality crossed my mind at that age, thinking 50. Well, and of course, I learned, it was great news having Bruce Willis and, and, um, and uh, oh, what's his name? Bruce Willis and uh, another chap, 64 years old and they're action heroes. It's like, wow, six is the new 40. So, I, so they, they give me hope, Bruce Willis and um, Liam Neeson. That was it, Liam Neeson. 
who happens to share a birthday with me, but it's a different year. He's definitely much older than me, but they're both both about the same age, 64 year old action heroes. We've got some hope yet. Um, so at 50, so I thought if I'm stronger at 55 than 50, if I'm stronger at 60 than 55, I'll definitely be heading in the right direction. I wonder how many of us have had similar goals on terms of strength. So strength, dy dynamism is very important as well as muscle mass itself. So um, one, the methods are as follows, very, very simple. And, and, and obviously looking at one's, so it's gait, it's walking speed. So I guess we'd have to be walking in the park and having this conversation and then people would be training behind. I can't keep up, Anthony, can't give up. So it's gait, it's walking speed is an indication. Now, the next time we're out and about, which hopefully will be soon and then later, and we've got other people around us, if you follow someone, you can tell from their backside and the way they're walking in the back, you can often tell if someone is older because of the nature of the shape they are and the way they're walking. So it's, I thought this is interesting, the sort of the way they're walking, yeah. So gait, gait is, is very important. And uh, it's great, yeah, fantastic. And so it's um, keeping active. So, so walking speed is one marker. There's also this dynamometer and it's hand grip strength. And hand grip strength has been well correlated with um, with leg strength because we can't all go to the gym and have it measured and do a, do a leg extension or squat to measure our, and to test ourselves with age age against a certain framework of, of weight. But dynamometers. Now this one I bought some years ago in 2016 and it's a bit it's a bit slippy on the spring so I pull it and it gets a bit stuck and it's also not geared it, it doesn't adjust. So this is this is El Cheapo. It was very cheap and economic and they, they go up to like 300, 300 pounds um, for a useful one. So if anyone's going to use it professionally, then you, then there are more, more the better ones where you can adjust for hand size. Um, so using that, uh, and then and then it gives you an indication as to how many pounds you press, and then, then you can go back to normal. Um, I broke my left hand when I was 21, so it's, that's less strong. So we got we got gait speed, we've got hand strength, hand grip strength is actually one of the best single measures of how long you're going to live. <laughs> extraordinarily so now you can get used to it so you can work on your hand grip strength and then so actually I, I got a strong right forearm i must live longer now and i basically it's a reflection of the whole and so um, this one is not such a good one I, i'm considering getting a better one which actually is not going to put it's going to adjust the hand size um, and that'll be very useful and what's also fascinating i found the literature you might have heard of something called c-reactive protein now c-reactive protein is is a bad molecule unto itself um Grip strength in men increases to about 50 years of age. Mm, okay. Um, grip strength may improve at 50, thank you, Stephen, um, but may diminish thereafter, is what I understand about. Um, so grip strength is one marker, gait speed is another. What's fascinating is the study they did was looking at grip strength and high sensitive C-reactive protein. So high CRP is a marker of inflammation in itself. So it's a bad molecule unto itself, it's also a reflection of inflammation which may stem from elsewhere. And uh, elevated CRP is one of the key markers that reflect that you're going to, you know, unfortunately have morbidity or die younger. So CRP is intrinsically a bad molecule. There are lots of inflammatory cytokines, but H high sensitivity CRP is generally commercially available in testing. So a lab test could be CRP, but otherwise it's, it's overall sort of strength and mobility. And of course, there are lots of different ways of measuring our physical performance. So that is the ways of measuring it is, is grip strength. And or, and or physical strength. So for those of us who are used to it, we, we've recently had some snow. So I shoveled some snow for an hour and I built a, I built a six foot um, snow mountain, really it was a, rather than a snowman. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I can, still, I can still do that, but how do we actually know if we're getting stronger or weaker? Because that every single shovel of snow, well, I, I, don't, I had the capacity to lift it and I could, I could do so for an hour, but it didn't really reflect my strength. Um, so I, I go to the gym, but not everyone's going to have gym equipment or, or have their own way of me measuring it. But are we getting stronger and how do we measure it? And so I think it's the, the lack of everyday awareness of that, because there's also another measurement is sitting on a, on a level chair where your legs are about perpendicular, your, your knees are perpendicular to the ground as you sit on this hard chair. And you stand up without using your hands. And so it's and how many times can you do that in a row? So it's basically a test of leg strength. So that's another way. And, but you'd have to measure yourself today and then measure yourself in a year's time or six months time to give an indication. Or is it very obvious that you can't lift so much now and it's very obvious that you're less strong than you were. So it's quite normal to have a lack of strength, but how do we know where we're at compared to a reference range? 
So it, it, it's actually, well, yes, of course, we're all going to get weaker as we get older, roughly speaking, unless we do something specific to, to reverse that. And again, at the age of 50, I had this consideration, I'm, I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be stronger at 55 than I am at 50. I'm going to be stronger at 60 than I was at 55 or 50. Um, so I made a resolution thinking, well, I'm going to do that. And I've discovered it's quite hard. It's quite hard. So so I, I, I was an endurance athlete. So I used to be a long distance runner and, and things went on longer and longer. And I, the longer they were, the sort of better I was relatively to the group of people I was doing something with. And I did a very fast marathon time. But that's 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 not going to stand me in good stead. So I've, I've long wanted to be stronger. And so I've engaged in a strength program whilst stretching, limbering up, make sure I'm not going to cause injury to myself. And I appreciate there are different types of exercise that are suited for different types of people. And I think the, the stretching, yoga, Pilates, I uh, love Qigong as well. Um, but also strength exercise, because I found that the, the stretching, although it was actually helping flexibility, and that's very important for mobility, no doubt about it. And that may help gait speed but strength work, actual muscle mass. So muscle mass is rather obvious for men to grow because you, your muscles get bigger and it's easy to see and feel. And it's okay, I can see the guy walking in the room and he looks like quite muscular. So he's obviously not got sarcopenia. And for women, it's not really popular. I would say the women I've met and I, I've had 19,000 clients overall. And, the, and I would say six and a half, 16 and a half thousand have been women. And I wouldn't say that, that any of them are particularly into muscle and so on, but you can't tell whether someone's more muscular or not, generally speaking. And women are more at risk because it's not such a, an obvious thing, are more at risk of having, because they've got less muscle mass to begin with. And that may also change more quickly at the, at the change of life and menopause as well. So, so men and women, but I would say women are more are very, very likely to have a risk of muscle loss. And it's very, very important indeed to maintain the well-being in the future. Muscle mass, basically muscle holds your shape. And, and muscle is the only tissue that nourishes all other tissues or has the capacity to do so. So it is a remarkable tissue that's, uh, that to me is well, well overlooked, generally speaking. It's vital. It's almost like it's, it's like you can tell from generally speaking, I suppose you need to be in a gym or on the beach to be able to see what someone's physique is like. Um, that, that isn't sort of covered up with, with clothes, essentially, but it's super, super important. Um, and it gives you a sense of confidence as well. So the, the, the population, the percentage is increasing tremendously. Um, and there's also something called sarcopenic obesity. So if, just because someone's overweight, it does give the increase, but not everybody who's obese has sarcopenia. And so it's not, not the case at all. And so you've got different people. You can't tell from looking at someone who's overweight as to whether they have sarcopenia or not really, unless they were to flex their muscles or lack of muscles. So we've got, we've got that. And so other studies and researchers have identified them saying, well, maybe it's not muscle mass, it's actually muscle strength. So we got, so it's, is it, is it dynopenia? Should that be the term we should use along with sarcopenia? Sarcopenia is a lack of flesh, dynopenia is a lack of strength. So again, the strength and muscle mass appears to be important. So we've got um, CRP as a blood test. We've got also got CR, uh, MRIs, CT scans, and DEXA testing for the physical physicality. And you've also got anthropometric or anthropomorphic measurements such as body mass index, calf circumference, upper arm circumference, leg circumference, and skin fold thickness. Um, you've also got various other markers which would require weights such as chest press or a leg extension or squat, and so on. And so we've, we've got those, those measures. So are you getting stronger or are you getting weaker with age? Um, I remember my dad, who's now 85 and struggling with various aspects of health, uh, unfortunately cancers and Parkinson's. So, you know, it comes home to, to roost. Um, is uh, he never, ever, ever trained. He never, never trained, never trained. So his muscle mass went, you know, right down. And that's actually then seriously affected his capacity to handle what's going on now. So how many of us have ever considered, you know, it's not just maintaining our shape, it's actually maintaining strength. And a lot of us, as we age, say, well, I'm getting older now, I won't do that hard thing, or I won't lift that heavy weight, and quite sensibly to avoid injury, of course. But what we realize, if our seeding capacity is lower, and we never, ever push it, it will continue to drop. And then your seeding, and that'll be it. Your ceiling will get lower and lower and lower. So, in fact, rather than engage in, in more endurance work, which is which is okay, it's supportive, but endurance work doesn't typically support muscle mass, and it rarely supports muscle strength. It simply supports the mitochondria for endurance, which is which is great. So, I would recommend a mix, of course. And I come on to this now about what to do about it. But resistance exercise is absolutely vital to stimulate the body's response 
to develop muscle mass. So muscle mass and strength and women's muscles are a bit denser, so less obvious to see than men's muscle. So there is a difference uh, with the hormone situation. So very, very important. If you care about your bones, all right, um, then you should care more about muscle because your muscle mass and muscle strength is more important than your bone. And yet I meet women whose whole lives are transformed by the diagnosis of osteopenia or osteoporosis. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, quick, what should I do? How much vitamin D should I take? And I'm thinking, hang on, well, if you're worried about your bone, you should be more worried about your muscle because your muscle strength is then going to be reflected by your bone strength. And your muscle supports every other tissue. Um, and as Stephen just pointed out, is a great reservoir. In fact, it's one of the very few reservoirs of glycogen, which is stored in your liver and your muscles for energy support. It's also the tissue that is involved that you can to support insulin sensitivity and is uh, therefore an anti-aging. All this conversation is about healthy aging. And if you want to age as healthy as you can, one needs to, I'm asserting, you need to engage in strength exercise and involve in some sort of resistance exercise. So there are various different forms of that, which I can, I can talk more about, but I mean, I'm not suggesting we all join a gym, et cetera, et cetera, but certainly resistance work, there are cables, um, there's body weight exercises to, to actually support your strength. And do you have a marker and a means by which you can assess your strength today? And then can you identify if you get stronger? Um, so whether it's obviously for women, less muscle strength in the upper body, if you're doing a straight, a really good straight push up, that can be quite difficult for some women. And you know, if you get to one, if you get to 10, once you got to 20, you may be not building any more strength. So you need to actually look, lift a heavier weight. So um, so, I, so I've seen the, the chats in there. I'll come back to the chat in a moment. So how much focus do we, do we devote to supporting our gut microbiome, supporting our healthy skin, supporting our, our, an anti-aging for the brain, such an important thing, of course, the number one organ, um, and for our cardiovascular system. And then we say, okay, I'll take vitamin K and vitamin D for bone, but what about our muscle? How much do we put into it? And I think a lot of the reason is that if we're not in the habit of pushing our bodies to the extent that it actually is hard work, so it's about painful, is, is hard work. Now, as it happens, I've been involved in exercise all my life since the age of seven i've been doing something i remember physically training from the age of seven so it's all very well for me to say and also i've been i did a sports science degree and i played many different sports so it's all right for me so um it's all right for me jack as the expression in english goes so i've got comments here i've been quite sedentary suddenly two weeks ago i've excruciating pain in muscles oh i might look at that um i'll come back to that len and i'll, I'll go through the chat um after i have um, said my bit so thank you for the chat i'll, I'll definitely come back to that I want to answer your questions as well on the subject. So what is the cause of sarcopenia? How can one obese individual or one lean person, because you can have sarcopenia if you're lean, you may have heard of the expression TOFI, um, which is thin on the outside, fat on the, sorry, fat on, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And you, we may know that there's, there's been a movement away from the, the zero size supermodels, that are zero size advocating um, too slim, too skinny a, a build. And so that's been that's been criticized and quite understandably so. So you can actually have sarcopenia and have a very low BMI and you can be very skinny and have lack of sarcopenia. So it's not just being overweight. So of all ages, but certainly when one's overweight, you're more likely to have more fat and less muscle mass. It's true. And what's underlying is is fundamentally this this very, very common thing we, we hear about called oxidative stress. So it's free radical damage, a lack of antioxidants. It's called reactive oxygen species oxidative stress and inflammation. So we hear that inflammation is the bane of, of, of health and it certainly is. Oxidative stress is closely associated with sarcopenia and effectively that leads to reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species um, and that hurt that and typically as we get older we have less antioxidant capacity to handle it but it also can occur after high intensity exercise particularly of the huff and puff type. So that's the endurance like, like going on the rowing machine doing uh, nor cycling. So in fact, it's the endurance huff and puff exercise, which can actually diminish what well, increases oxidative stress. Um, and that can then um, uh, lead to a problem with the stimulation of muscle and atrophy. Whereas if you exercise intensively, you get less oxidative stress, but you stimulate the response, which is to effectively <clears throat> encourage muscle protein synthesis. So what happens in sarcopenia is we've got muscle, prote muscle protein breakdown that occurs on an ongoing basis. And then at night and after the stimulus of exercise, we have muscle protein um, building. So muscle protein synthesis. And the balance of the two is absolutely key um, in term, terms of what happens. So reactive oxygen species, as with all things negative for all conditions, 
is one is one factor. But we've also got um, proteins to consider in our diet, certain amino acids and certain antioxidants. And I'll share with you the relatively small number of these things which have been found to be very effective to stop sarcopenia happening and reverse it. And there's a very interesting antioxidant um, from, from, from the sea effectively, um, or something in the sea that uh, really, really can help protect um, the mitochondria. And I've got, a, I've got a slide of the, of the actions of this particular antioxidant, which is called astaxanthin, um, which you think, well, it's good for my eyes. Well, no, it's actually more important, amazingly, for muscles. Um, so I'll, I'll show you an information on that. So these inflammatory cytokines combined with age, combined with less protein, the vast majority of people I meet here as they get older, they tend to choose to eat less protein. So I'll talk to you about protein. So that's why I asked you the question, how much protein do you eat? Do you know your weight in kilograms? And, and then we can work out whether that's an ideal amount according to these working groups in four continents and internationally around the world where they've had dedicated PhDs and scientists are figuring out how much protein we need. Now this may be, this is fascinating and it may, it may change what you do um, in terms of your diet. And also it raises question marks about vegetarians and vegans, which we'll come on to. <clears throat> Looking forward to that conversation um, effectively. How do you do it if you're a vegetarian? So we've got this inflammatory molecules, so reactive oxygen species. Um, so how do we prevent and reverse it? Well, we engage in physical activity, particularly of a, a resistance type. We've got to make sure we have adequate protein. So let's talk about the protein now. Okay, so protein. Um, the typical, the RDA is the ridiculous dietary arbitrary or indeed the, the, um, the recommended daily allowance and the or reference nutrient intake. There are various different ways of looking at it. Um, for, and, and it's actually the RDA, as one expert on protein says, was never, ever, 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 ever designed to be the optimum amount. So the RDA is very, very different to the optimum amount. That's basically the survival amount. It's a bit like the vitamin C, the RDA in, in the UK is 60 milligrams. What? Well, if you, you know, the, the average person might actually needs 2000 milligrams a day, especially when we want to support our immune system against the virus. And, and my friend Patrick Holford has got this um, C COVID organization up and written the papers talking about the, uh, the connection between vitamin C. And it seems that, it, that when they've done the studies and they've actually corrected the variables, the vitamin C insufficiency is the single biggest reason why people die from this SARS-CoV-2, not age, because as we get older, we have less vitamin C. So although age was deemed to be the factor, age and two and a half comorbidities, and the average age of 82, actually vitamin C levels were found to have a strong correlation than those other factors. So fascinating. So he's engaging with intensive care unit doctors, giving IV vitamin C, and it's basically a scurvy situation. Yeah, scurvy situation exists, and that's uh, even stronger than vitamin D, and we know how, how important that is as well. Um, so massively useful information there. So protein um, comes from what word? So my brother's Greek comes in handy, although he didn't teach me this, but protos, prototype, proto, means first. Protein, first. It's the first most important nutrient uh, that was discovered at that time. Protein, that's what it is. It's made up of amino acids, essential and non-essential amino acids. And how much protein do we need a day per kilogram of body weight um, to actually protect against muscle loss. Um, it's called a, blunt, a blunted muscle protein synthesis or synthetic response. So we get a blunted response. And so how much do we need to eat um, effectively to overcome the, the muscle loss? And again, as I said, most of my clients as I get old tend to say, tend to choose, including my parents. They've said, oh, as I got old, I haven't felt like eating that or that protein. So I tend to eat more vegetarian. I think there tends to be a bit of a mood to that. Um, in our society anyway. And so it's, I'll tell you the numbers of the grams per kilogram now, and then we'll figure out what that translates into. But this is this is to get our heads around. First of all, it's the protein story. If you don't have enough protein, it's what the muscles are built of. And if every 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 tissue in the body is made from protein, and we need the, the, the essential amino acids, um, and also we do need non-essential amino acids, but particularly the essential amino acids. And for, for muscle, there's this group of three amino acids that are particularly important. And of those three amino acids, there's one that's particularly important. And also potentially it's downstream metabolite may be important too. So let's talk about how much uh, protein we need per kilogram. So grams per kilogram. And we need, uh, apparently, according to these, these, these official bodies, and they all agree. So these are eminent PhDs, you know, lifelong career scientists looking at the data, and it's 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. I'm going to put that into perspective for you in a minute. As to, so uh, I've got I've got the weights in front of me. I've done the calculations, 
Um, so 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram body weight is what we need for dietary protein. So this means if you're 60 kilograms, hands up, you're 60 kilograms, 60 grams, I'm not 60 grams, I'm 70 kilograms. So, so if you're 60 kilograms, that means the reference range for you is 72 to 90 grams of protein a day, 72 to 90 grams. If you're 65 kilograms, that takes you to 78 grams to about 97.5 grams of protein, 78 to 97 grams of protein per day. If you're 70 kilograms like me, it's 84 to 105 grams, 84 to 105 grams of protein. And if you're 75 kilograms, it's 90 to 112 grams. And if you're 80 kilograms, it's 96 to 120 grams. And then it goes on like that. So what does that translate into exactly? Because um, it's not the same, same as having, if I have a steak or I have some chicken, it's not the whole weight of the steak or the chicken. It's actually what's the protein content of it. So I've got, I've got some fun, some fun correlates to help us understand uh, what that would translate into. If we were to eat, um, you know, that much protein, what would it look like? And so um, given that an egg contains seven grams of protein, I thought I'd just do something a bit simplistic before we come back to looking at, at steak and chicken and, and beans and milk and tofu and cottage cheese or things like that. So, so if we were 60 kilograms, 60 kilograms, um, how many eggs would that mean per day? So I've just done a simple translation just for eggs. Of course, it's insane. Um, I wouldn't recommend anyone do this at the home. So, so it's a bit like, um, yeah, don't do this at home, folks. But it gives an indication of how much protein we need per day to maintain a muscle mass and prevent sarcopenia. Mm. It's, if you're 60 kilograms, it'd be 10 to 13 eggs a day. 10 to 13 eggs a day. If you're 65 kilograms, it's 11 to 14 eggs. If you're 70 kilograms, that's 12 to 15 eggs a day I've got to eat. Oh my God, if that was the only protein food I was eating. If you're 75 kilograms, it's 13 to 16 eggs a day. And if you're 80 kilograms, lo and behold, it's 14 to 17 eggs a day. Whew. Well, I know that egg, eggs combined you up. I'm not suggesting that you have a mono protein diet but you get the gist of it. It's like, whoa, that's a lot of protein. So let's look about some more sensible um, sort of food. So a four ounce sirloin steak gives you about 34 grams of protein, 34. So let's say that, let's say I'm gonna make it about myself here, six, 70 kilograms, so maybe that's 70 kilograms, 84 to 105 grams, 84, 84 to 105 grams. So if I had a sirloin steak of four ounces at one of my meals, that's 34 grams, that's about, that's about one third of the let's say 100 grams that I'm aiming for, um, and I'm taking exercise, so, so that's one third. So I would need to eat three four ounce sirloin steaks if I was going to be eating steaks that day. But if we took the chicken chicken breast, chicken a three ounce chicken breast might give you about 25, 26 grams of protein. So that be 26, so it's 105 divided by 26. That's so about a quarter of my protein needs. So I could have a sirloin steak for one meal. I could have a chicken breast for another meal, and I'm still that's about 50. 60, it's about 60 grams of protein. I'm still looking for 40 grams of protein for the other two meals. If I had some ground turkey, three ounces again, I'd have about 22 grams of protein. Um, if I had some tuna and about three ounces of tuna, that's about 22 grams of protein. If I have tofu uh, for three ounces of that, I've just got about 13 grams of protein if I had three ounces of tofu. So you get to see that, I mean, a large egg, by the way, is, is the maximum is about seven grams. Phew. And if I had this, uh, I want to go vegetarian, I've got kidney beans. I said a half a cup of, of cooked, well-cooked kidney beans, and that's about six or seven grams. Phew. So half a cup is about the same as, a, as an egg. But of course, the quality of the protein in the egg may be a uh, higher biological value. Ooh, so that's a lot of protein. So this is something I find there's a lot of resistance to. It's a remarkable amount of protein that we need. And I'm not a fan of, of overdoing anything in particular. But the calorie choices we've got, we've got proteins, we've got fats, and we've got carbohydrates. What are you going to have? Well, the carbohydrates uh, increase insulin, increase inflammation, and many individuals can't tolerate carbohydrates from one form or another, especially those with inflammatory bowel disease, where they may have a digestive issue as well, um, may contribute to um, SIBO, small intestinal bowel uh, bacterial overgrowth, and uh, many, many other conditions, because carbo all carbohydrates effectively elicit some sort of insulin response, and insulin in excess is a pro-inflammatory hormone. So we've got to make so it's fats and proteins and, and carbohydrates. So typically, as we get older, and certainly there's an inflammation involved, we want to consider limiting carbohydrates. And therefore, we need to emphasize more fat and protein. And often with protein foods comes fat. So for example, an egg and a steak and chicken breast or chicken legs, certainly, you're going to get fats with that too. 
So it's a remarkable amount of protein. How much protein do you have and what, what's your weight? How much protein do you need to support your muscle mass? Now, if you're gonna engage in resistance exercise on a regular basis, then you're gonna be looking to ensure that you have that protein on a regular basis too. So you need the stimulus from the outside. The external stimulus is the exercise you're doing, the resi resi resistance exercise, um, and then you want adequate amino acids uh, afterwards. Now there are protein powders much more available now than there were in uh, 1989 or even 1999. Um, and so there are, there are ways of supporting that. And what's fascinating for me to learn is that you may, we may be aware of the glycemic index. The glycemic index reflects the rate at which a certain amount of carbohydrate raises blood sugar um, above a level and certain sugar is given the guide and the G, it's a GI score and, and glucose is given a score of 100. And, um, and so any, any score above, I guess, 70 is, is a high one and we want to have the lowest possible. So glycemic index we're familiar with. However, what's interesting is I discovered there are fast and slow proteins is there are proteins you consume. And actually the good news is that you actually want fast proteins as opposed to fast sugars. The fast proteins get their amino acids into your bloodstream faster and they have an anabolic response, an anabolic effect that's greater than slower proteins. So most protein powders will get into the system quicker than if you eat chicken or fish or a steak, for example. So they will get an or egg. So the whole food will only have a limited effect. But if you have whey protein, it's a fast it's a fast amino acid, whereas, and very few people have, have casein, for example, but it's faster than pea and it's faster than casein. So whey protein is a fast protein um, and, and all protein powders will be pretty effective because they'll get into the system quicker than if you had eaten the whole food containing the protein. So there is an advantage of protein powders. This is where technology comes in. Um, and um, come on here, I think they might just go. There are two different kinds of protein in the body, collagen protein and non-collagen protein. Thank you for that. I, I can see the chat as it comes up briefly before I go back to the chat uh, and see if I can answer some of those things. Uh, collagen is, uh, there are different types of collagen, type one, type two, I think even type three, even maybe type four, but type one, type two, and type three. And collagen is the most abundant proteins in the human body. And what's fascinating about collagen is that it doesn't contain all the essential amino acids. And so you don't need all the essential amino acids in the body to make collagen, um, but in order to make muscle mass to protect you from the hazards of a sarcopenic existence and state of being, which then leads to all kinds of negatives, um, you actually need the, all the essential amino acids, but particularly you need the branch chain amino acids, which is leucine, isoleucine, and valine. So leucine, isoleucine, and it's apparently, according to studies I've read from all the years, it's about 33% about of the muscle um, in, in, is made up of branch chain amino acids. So one third of the muscle mass will be available uh, from the branch chain amino acids. Leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And of those three, it appears from the studies that leucine on its own has a, an impact on, on, on the signaling for muscle protein synthesis more than, the, than isoleucine or valine. So leucine, but either which way, and branch chain amino acids are, are useful. There's a downstream metabolite of leucine called HMB. So it's 5-hydroxymethylbutyrate, 5-HMB. And that has been found to be useful in some studies to show that if you take that, so it's actually kind of like, it's like taking P5P of B6 compared to pyridoxine. You're taking the active form and it's more effective. So 5-HMB, it tastes disgusting in a powder. So I recommend capsules if ever you're going to consider such a thing. I try, I thought the powder is so much cheaper. I'll buy the powder and I could barely tolerate it. So it needs to be encapsulated if ever you were to try that. But five, uh, so HMB or leucine or branch chain amino acids, any one of those three and or whey protein or other protein powders. So that there are means to achieve your protein intake uh, compared to having to eat so much steak, so many eggs and so many breast of chicken, some legs of chicken, and so many cans of tuna, and so on. It can be quite challenging to get that much protein in. And this is, this is from very conservative scientists looking at what's going to protect our bodies. Um, and yet it seems to be in conflict with, with what people's impressions are about how much protein we need. Surely we need to go more vegan, more vegetarian, and contribute to a healthier planet. And, and surely the adverts about having, having corn as, and saving the planet, so they must be true. It must be correct. And I'm not sure about that. That's a subject for a different day about whether uh, rearing animals on planet Earth. And of course, there are some ways with these these mega farms. Of course, I'd recommend you know pasture fed, grass fed uh, animals that are that are roaming rather than trapped in a cage. Of course, um, and also the food that they're fed has a distinct impact on, on on the quality of that food. So we know that that 
grain-fed um, farm farm salmon is actually not necessarily even healthy for us, whereas the wild salmon are considerably uh, different and are is good for us. So we got we got various different ways. So we need to exercise. We need to eat enough protein, and we could consider some specific agents in the form of proteins or branched-chain amino acids or leucine, or even the five HMB hydroxymethylbutyrate, which is the downstream metabolite of leucine, to support our muscles. There's also creatine, creatine monohydrate. Um, it helps to support the the hydration, but also muscle size and strength. And it has been found to be useful, although I've got question marks about it potentially challenging the kidneys. Um, and it'll be relatively low dose per day, but, it, but it, it could be something to consider. I'm not sure whether I would recommend or promote creatine per se. And then in terms of other nutrients, vitamin D, surprise, surprise, has been found to be very useful. It's, it's obviously a hormone and vitamin D has been found to be useful and it's been found to be low in those individuals with sarcopenia as they age. There's a correlation between sarcopenia and vitamin D status. Ooh, so vitamin D, good for us for other reasons, not just bones, but also for muscle mass. But really, we need to engage in physical activity to maintain muscle mass. And particularly if you've got low muscle mass, it's going to be hard work uh, on a regular basis, at least three times a week, I would say, to restore your muscle strength and muscle mass. So strength and, and mass is vital. And then there is this super duper antioxidant from the, from the outside of a, of a, of a lobster, um, uh, outside of a, sh a shellfish, astaxanthin, it's uh, from the sea. Um, astaxanthin has remarkable properties, and especially when it's combined with zinc, for example, or, or tocotrienol, which is a form of vitamin E, um, and that's been clinically trialed. So it's also got the uh, incredible virtue of doing something remarkable. It's not just one of the best antioxidants um, for muscle mass. It's been found there's something called non-use or disuse muscle. So if you're not using muscle, is there anything, so as we sit uh, and, and possibly um, less of a threat to our health than governments, I understand that, but if we sit and we've got a challenge to our health and we're, we're sitting at risk, and it seems that, again, if you go to the gym in the evening, it doesn't offset the dangers that were occurring due to sitting down all day. And I find myself sitting a lot. So I, I remind myself of this and every hour, I do my best to get up and, and run around and go on down the stairs. There's, an, there's very few nutrients that can protect muscle mass as we sit and do nothing to stop it, to help it being lost. There's a, how can we stop the muscle being lost? And it seems that astaxanthin has the incredible capacity, and, and I guess it's yet to be more fully proven, but in, in some studies at least, it's been shown that if you take astaxanthin, it actually protects against muscle loss, even when you're not using them. Now, I wish I had to say that uh, Anthony Haynes' astaxanthin is the one to get. It's the only one to get. And you must buy it from Stephen now, but it's not the case. So I'm not recommending a particular brand of astaxanthin, but it's great to see that astaxanthin, it's quirky. Why would it be that one and not other antioxidants like lipoic acid or N-acetylcysteine or glutathione and so on? Um, but astaxanthin has, has a, um, a high merit of being able to protect lean muscle tissue from, from being lost in the body without actually having to exercise. Now, it doesn't mean to say you can maintain a super fit um, astaxanthin, A-S-T-A, -A, asta, and then xanthin, X-A-N-T-H-I-N, astaxanthin. Thanks for that question. So it's, uh, it's remarkable. It's, um, it's more and more available now, um, but it's one of the only substances that possibly along with, with five um, HMB, hydroxymethylbutyrate, and possibly leucine, uh, that, but, but certainly astaxanthin can protect against lean muscle mass. So it seems like it's a it's a definite go-to, and there's very limited things to choose from. Yeah, it's an analog of beta carotene that terminates in an active keto. Oh, thank you very much for that. So, but again, astaxanthin in that form, we can't convert beta carotene into astaxanthin. Um, in fact, about around about forty percent of Northwest Europeans or Europeans can't convert beta carotene to vitamin A. As um, so that's a slight separate subject, but astaxanthin, zinc, um, zinc is vital for all growth and, and insulin growth factor. Um, no, you can't convert either into the other, exactly. So astaxanthin is hugely beneficial. So you've got adequate protein, adequate exercise, adequate vitamin D. So the good news is there are limited things to do. It's not like there's a multiplicity because the, the antioxidants that exist uh, are multiple. I mean, there are just lots and lots of them to choose from. So we have essential amino acids and branched chain amino acids. Um, so, and, and that's what we're going to do. So in a study looking at um, physical activity with the placebo and or supplementation of whey protein and essential amino acids and vitamin D plus physical activity. So they compared two groups, physical activity or physical activity with supplements. And they discovered that lo and behold, the people who took both, who did both the works had increased fat-free mass. They had increased skeletal muscle. 
they had uh, a better distribution of fat, they had increased hand grip strength, they had a better summary score for physical um, components and performances, they had increased activities of daily living, they had an increased uh, better overall nourishment, and they had an increased level of insulin-like insulin growth factor, IGF-1. Now we need to be careful of IGF-1 for cancer risk, yes, but you need adequate muscle to support the whole of health, and it's a vital tissue, not just for glycogen, but for all other, all other factors. They also found that the group who had the physical activity with the supplements had lower level of C-reactive protein compared to that group which just did physical activity uh, on its own. So um, it's, uh, again, it's, it's super important for overall health. There's no doubt about it. Maintaining muscle mass is absolutely key to prevent and wellness. Also, it maintains your, your youthfulness. It maintains your physicality, your physical shape. It also um, sets you up well for not being ill in the future and dying later. Uh, so it's aimed at compressing morbidity to the very last moment of life uh, and being independent and, and your own man or your own woman up until that moment in time. So the protein factor is, is really challenging for some people. So I'm really, cu I'm really curious and I don't know quite how, but without protein powders, I don't know as a vegetarian how you get enough protein, to be honest. I really don't, but it, protein is very important indeed. Again, protein, the first most important nutrient. Carbohydrates are not essential nutrients. So fats are essential. You've got the essential fatty acids. We've got two of those. We don't tend to have enough of those either, but fat and we also um, don't need, um, we don't need carbohydrates per se. <sighs> so um, there really, I present that to you. So are we, are we taking enough exercise? Is the exercise of the right kind? Is it something that we're challenging ourselves with so we're getting stronger? Have you got a means by which to measure your strength and your physical performance? If not, is there a way of forming that for yourselves? Is it, I'm not suggesting you go to the gym and start doing some squats if you haven't done any before. Um, there's leg extension machines, which are actually much less prone to injury. And there's hand grip strength and there's gait speed, there's walking speed as well. So what I'm saying is that I'd rather you didn't do more endurance work but I recommend you combine, um, yeah, sure, cycling and endurance work and walking, but also with strength exercises. Uh, and how do you know you're getting stronger? So and can you, are you going to set yourself a goal, just like I did when I was 55 years ago, to I'm going to be stronger at 55 than 50, I'm going to be stronger at 60 than I'm 55. I did a personal best this year on, on a bench press. It's hard to imagine, but I, I, it's, it's hard work. It's not a hard work, but I'm, I'm actually aiming for a peak seeding of activity as opposed to elongating the energy output with endurance, because that's not going to help muscle mass. It's actually maintaining that peak strength that's absolutely vital. So it is necessarily hard work. Of course, I recommend you get guidance if you're lifting heavy weights uh, and do it gradually from, from now. But I would say assess yourself now and see if you can then um, ha have some sort of markers in the sand, as it were, as to, as to pit yourself against um, how you're going to be in the future. What progress, what markers are we going to get? So um, I'd like to thank you so much indeed for, for listening to what is almost um, almost a bang on an hour. I'm going to look at the chat box, which I haven't done before now, and see if I'm going to go up. And thank you very much indeed for your comments. And then I'd love to have your questions to see if I can answer them um, directly. So um, I'm starting at the top. So skeletal muscle mass. Yes, that's what we're talking about. Um, OK, thank you very much indeed, Stephen, for your comments in there. Um, so fossil, it's lovely, this um, Muriel, fantastic. Fossil fuel addiction leads to excessive sitting. <laughs> it takes a healthy adult about 100 hours to generate the amount of energy available uh, from a gallon of gas. Thank you so much for that. Um, absolutely. Um, okay. Um, somebody still swings a hammer and uses a shovel regularly. Mm, grip strength, yeah. Uh, okay. Andropause, so menopause, andropause, and with low testosterone. Testosterone, the level of testosterone in men and women is vital for muscle mass. So it's one of the hormones, cortisol, thyroid hormone, uh, estrogens, and testosterone. And testosterone is vital. And testosterone, to maintain testosterone, we need adequate zinc. So zinc is very important for growth and also for testosterone. Um, and so certainly testosterone will be a factor for sure. And that will result in their strength. So maintain testosterone is vital, but you still so you need the external stimulus, which is the exercise, the internal capacity for that. And so testosterone is also supported by lean muscle tissue. So lean muscle tissue supports testosterone. So those with more muscle have more testosterone and vice versa. So it's a, uh, whereas if you just, just give testosterone to someone without the exercise, that won't necessarily improve matters. Um, so, 
Um, how does muscle nourish other tissue? It is a reservoir of the nutrients that are required for all other tissue because it contains all the essential amino acids. So it's, a, it's, a, it's actually available for, for glycogen, for glucose support. There are glycogenic amino acids which get converted to glucose, but also it's a literally, it's a physical reserve of the key nutrients that support every other tissue, essentially. In massage school, they taught us that it's our muscles, not our bones, that keep us upright. The bones are just something that muscles attach to. Thank you for that. Absolutely. So muscles, I would say, more important than bone, um, for sure. And strength hormone, thank you for this comment. Strength hormone also supports growth hormone, which definitely reduces with age. And you want to be very careful. I know some people older than me have said, oh, I can take some growth hormone. That'll help. Growth hormone is a promoter of potentially of cancers. So we need to be very careful with that. You want to trigger your own level. And growth hormone also requires adequate zinc for any growth to occur. Um, this is a comment I was reading out earlier. I've been quite sedentary. Suddenly two weeks ago, I have excruciating pain in muscles. Sorry to hear that. And some, some same kind of pain I had in the past when I overworked out and exercise sounds like a so, so strong, um, sounds like a muscle pull strain. Um, wow. So is it possible to have such pain from underuse? Well, certainly anyone engaging in from being sedentary, I would engage. If you can engage in exercise, I would to have a gradual process. I hope that's common sense, but gradual process. But is it is intriguing, suggesting that that muscle pain is is interesting. Is it too much lactic acid? That's a distinct feeling we get after exercising. But uh, to have such an excruciating pain does sound to be quite odd. And I would say, I wonder if it's worthwhile engaging as someone who's a physical therapist, uh, certainly engaging in um, gradual exercise in a graded format would be ideal. Inflammation interferes with growth, definitely. <clears throat> and also sabotages growth hormone. Thank you for that, Stephen. Definitely. So um, it's, um, the question there is about the same grams per kilogram of protein for overweight folk. Yes, um, if you're overweight, it's the same grams for, for kilograms. Yes, it is. Um, how do you convert kilograms to pounds? I'll tell you, it's 2.25. One kilogram is 2.25 pounds. Oh, yeah, 2.2. That's already been answered. I've got a brilliant host here. Uh, that's a little question. So, yeah. Um, and um, thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you for the comments. I'm going down the chat box. Still, um, azazanthin, very useful. So it's really useful antioxidant. It's amazing. I, I haven't got a brand specifically. I'm not really going to promote any particular product. Um, any alternative to whey? Like, many individuals can't tolerate whey, although it may be very low in casein. Some individuals can't tolerate whey, in which case almost any, any protein powder per se, well, I wouldn't obviously wouldn't recommend casein, that's dairy anyway. But I would say any protein powder, as long as it's got a good ratio, which they most do of branch chain amino acids. So leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Usually um, th those three are given in specific amounts on the side of the, the pot. So that will definitely be superior in speed, getting into your bloodstream and then promoting the anabolic effect compared to eating a food, which will take a longer period of time. Um, vitamin C is vital. Um, okay. Yeah, we can't go to the gym because of, of, of COVID, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it is more difficult now perhaps to, to engage in that. But um, how do you create a home routine of strength exercise without the machines? Well, certainly you can use body weight uh, for strength. You can use even, you can use one-legged squats holding, holding onto the, the, the chair to balance yourself. Start with squat, physical sort of two legs and then squatting on one leg which requires obviously taking the weight off one leg. That can be quite challenging. It's quite interesting to see what we can do there. So body weight, first of all, any, any reps, beyond about 12 or 12, typically you're, not, you're actually more promoting endurance than, than strength. Um, so once you've got beyond 12, certainly it's, um, I guess you could put a rucksack on your back doing squats, uh, if you have some weights on that, um, and or one-legged squats, uh, which are actually quite challenging, which also supports your mobility and, and, and fixating muscles for balance as well. Um, love to spend more time on that. And, and there may well be some fantastic YouTube videos on, on home exercises, uh, more and more available now because everyone's at home. Um, what form of zinc do you recommend? You know, there are different forms and generally, um, you know, zinc citrate's pretty well absorbed. There's zinc picolinate, there's zinc um, uh, amino acid chelates, which would be transported. But generally speaking, um, the amount we need is, I, I would say, up to 100 gram, 100 milligrams, sorry, 100 milligrams of zinc is being used by the doctors to, to treat and address those with COVID or, or SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but I would say looking at about 25 to 30 milligrams of zinc a day, but certainly high levels are used, I know, by the, the emergency doctors who uh, are treating that then. 
uh, alpha ketoglutarate or uh, uh, yes alpha ketoglutarate um, is a nitrogen free version of glutamate and glutamine uh, it is different and it supports the krebs cycle and energy production um, an alternative protein powder um, yeah, the vegetable and the beauty of technology is they can take all the proteins out of vegetables and get them into a, in, into into a powder, and you can never eat that amount of vegetables at any one sitting. But it's taken all the protein out and concentrated it. So I'm a fan of that technology, um, um, but again, I would typically recommend the ones with the fewest ingredients in them uh, in terms of sugars as well. Um, uh, autophagy, yeah, autophagy or autophagy, uh, autophagy is self cleaning, self eating, uh, and really that that requires. Uh, and that's breaking down the tissue and cleaning the, the system. It's possible actually to build muscle and engage in autophagy, but that requires a, quite a fixed routine of intermittent fasting and the right kind of exercise and stimulus too. So, and, and typically you could say the opposite of autophagy is actually the building an anabolic because it's actually a catabolic process. Um, so, it's a, so it's actually quite a delicate balance between stimulating growth um, and actually and then breaking down tissue. And so typically autophagy, autophagy is a process engaging with fasting and going into ketosis. Um, and then that typically moves you away. But certainly a, uh, a short process or, of or like a fasting process of five to 800 calories for five days in a monitor situation, having the right you know, density and nutrients and supplements can be very supportive for getting you into ketosis. And you can measure that with a saliva strip or, or a urine strip or as a, there's breathometers that can actually measure where you've got ketones. So um, it, it, I'm fascinated by that balance of how can you engage in a sort of a, an autophagy at, and, and, and actually engage in an, an anabolic process and maintain muscle strength at the same time. Because there is a risk when everyone goes on a fast or weight loss program, you'll lose lean muscle tissue. And if you're towards heading towards sarcopenia, that's the last thing you want to do. And yet you actually want to improve your overall metabolism. So that is a potential challenge, but it does take some guidance and there is, there is a way to navigate through. The names of the chain amino acids, the branch chain amino acids, is, uh, again, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, and they're often available uh, together in, in one supplement, BCAAs. Too many reps versus too, too few reps. Effectively, if you have, uh, if you can do lots of reps with a weight, it, it means you're, you're basically training endurance, you're not gaining, not gaining strength. So to stimulate mitochondrial biogenesis, then ideally you do a low number of reps. So really you want a combination of, of, training, of training. So endurance and work, medium and then strength work but you need to do the strength work i'd maintain to maintain again dine diner meaning strength dynapenia sarcopenia to maintain your strength you need to keep the seeding of the weight or the, the weight you're lifting at the highest level you possibly can do not think well i'm getting older now i'll lift a lighter weight no you lift the heavy weight less times effectively so you, the aim is to maintain the absolute peak uh, strength the typical dose of um, astaxanthin it varies, but in the study I referred to in terms of the, the exercise and supplements and the exercise without supplements, it was 12 milligrams of astaxanthin. I've seen studies looking at six milligrams of astaxanthin being effective. Astaxanthin, so 12 milligrams. Um, does it depend on body weight? Well, not really, but six to 12 milligrams um, of astaxanthin. Um, and I would say the more Perhaps the heavy one is, or the more overweight, or the more you need support, and you, you think you've got a degree of oxidative stress, I would probably look at the 12 milligrams. I don't believe there's a negative impact from, from having a little bit more. Yeah, the zinc's needed for all protein synthesis. It's required for zinc fingers, which requires the ability to take the messenger from the DNA, uh, put it into the endoplasmic reticulum, and build the protein. The zinc always had to be balanced by copper. Yes, smart comment. And zinc does have to be balanced by copper. You're absolutely right. Um, so it is perhaps ideal if you take zinc for a period of time, then maybe you certainly would typically increase your need for copper. The typical ratio that I've heard that's ideal is about, it varies, but seven to 10 to one, um, typically, maybe it's even 12 to one, but without knowing where you're at, and certainly women with um, the HRT or some estrogens can increase copper, and that might be beneficial to have zinc without the copper. So without knowing exactly where you're at, uh, may, may be difficult to know um, how much copper you need, but certain individuals do need copper. Copper is also needed for elastin, connective tissue. It's also needed for the adrenals too, um, and can be underrated as a nutrient of importance, but many people have excess copper. And so thank you for raising that. Um, but you don't need, as Stephen has quite rightly pointed out, thank you very much indeed, you don't need copper to make protein. Um, okay, what, what's seen any difference with protein intake with raw meat as opposed to cooked? Good question. I don't know the answer to that. 
I don't know the, is it more if it's easier to digest the raw protein then I guess you then then it would have a faster impact of raising amino acids in your bloodstream and therefore have a greater anabolic effect because it is faster otherwise I I, I question on eating raw meat um, how about the risk of too few reps causing muscle tears and inducing fibrosis to the Arnold Schwarzenegger effect and other and other bodybuilders uh, classic um, where you see injuries and you see their physiques being affected even more. So I think, um, yes, if you go, you don't have to do the one-off uh, personal best max rep. Um, so, so yes, certainly warming up, having a greater scale, absolutely ensuring you warmed up first and stretched for sure. I, I totally recommend it. I wouldn't recommend you go for your personal one-off message um, for that. Um, and uh, there've been quite a number of famous Tom, oh, I forget his name, I was into bodybuilding or looking at the magazines once upon a time. Uh, remember individuals putting muscles and never been the same. I mean, ripping muscles and tears and never been the same since. Um, older people may lose quantity of various digestive enzymes. So you need to attend to those, absolutely. As we get, it's estimated about 40% of the body's energy is diverted towards digestive function. And as soon as we get less energy, as we get older, we have less energy, you make less pancreatic enzymes, which is a and hydrochloric acid. And we need those hydro the hydrochloric acid and pancreatic enzymes to digest the protein. It's true. And actually you need zinc to make um, hydrochloric acid along with vitamin B1 as well. So um, certainly if you have maldigestion, that could lead to imbalances no matter what one eats. Um, and certainly um, hydrochloric acid, and, and certainly that has a pH of one. Uh, apple cider vinegar has a pH of three. So it's not that effective for helping with protein digestion, but certainly herbal bitters, um, and having adequate hydrochloric acid. Very good comment. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, collagen, uh, some information there. Six to 12 milligrams of acetaminophen. Thank you very much indeed. Um, what's the relationship between protein intake and albumin and serum total protein, if any? Very good question. Um, I've looked at this for some years as it happens. I'm familiar with this. Um, and typically albumin and protein, are, albumin is a pretty good marker of protein status. But for me, it's actually, I've had many individuals come in and they're eating a high amount of protein, higher than that, which I've described today, and they've got low albumin, and low protein. So it's got to do with digestion and then the ability to handle the protein in the liver. So I think it's, it's about protein handling as opposed to the actually, you can't tell it about the protein intake. So I would say that if someone's got a, a on the face of it, their diet's showing me a high protein intake and they've got, they got lower albumin or the albumin protein ratio is uh, albumin, albumin, also globulin, albumin globulin ratio is, is, is not right. Um, then I would wonder about hydrochloric acid need and pancreatic enzymes, which refers back to that previous comment. So I think the blood test can, can be useful, but in no way does it tell you how much protein you're eating. I've seen so many of those which have no correlation with protein intake as far as I've seen. Um, isometric exercises can be useful. Um, you can have sets of springs and I've got this and I've done this myself. So I did a period of time and I looked at the studies. One showed isometric exercise with kinetic exercise, so, so basically full, full range of motion exercises, and they tested the athlete's um, muscle strength and size at the beginning and the end. They had a washout period and, and then changed over. hope I've made that clear. So one group did isometrics of certain exercises, and the other group did the range of motion, and they measured them beginning and end, and they measured their strength gains effectively and the muscle mass girth in their legs and their arms. And um, then they had a washout period, and then, then the other group that was doing the, the kinetic movement to do isometric exercises, and they discovered that they were pretty much similar. So isometric exercises is part of it. They're static, so it's actually keeping, keeping the tension, and it necessarily is, is taxing on the system. Um, so I've, I've actually, then I engaged in a, a guy, I bought some springs, really tough to pull, and I found that my, my muscle mass actually increased more than by doing the kinetic myself. For me personally, I find the isometric actually increased muscle mass more and I'm quite slim and lean build. So it's crazy to see the muscle mass change. Uh, so that was, that was interesting um, indeed for that. So I think that comes to the end of, of the chat, if I can get down there. So I think it does. Thank you very much indeed for those questions. So I hope I've been able to, and then with Stephen's help, thank you so much indeed for that. Very happy to have, to speak to somebody if they want to raise the question or we can go on the chat or certainly I can get feedback from Stephen. So thank you so much for listening. I spoke a lot of words. I tend to go quite quickly. Um, so you've now got the answers to the question. Uh, 1989, sarcopenia identified, first study, 1999. And then there've been 20,000 plus studies uh, with sarcopenia in it. <clears throat> um, 
the tissue that nourishes everything else in the body is potentially its muscle mass because it's a nourishing, it, it has all the amino acids in it. Um, and the, um, the percentage of the people who have sarcopenia at 21 to 33%, this is a massive number. If they require, if you're fully sarcopenic, you are less capable and then you are less dependent and you require somebody else that's gonna be costly as well. The most dangerous thing um, that kills more people other than the, uh, the uh, non, well, it's actually a corporation government um, is sitting. So if we sit down and take it, this is really bad news on, on all levels. Um, and how much protein do you need per day? Thank you very much, Steve, for putting that in, Stephen. 1.2 to 1.5 grams of kilogram. Now, I've read a study looking at a group, they took a group of fit people and they fed them two grams per kilogram for a day for a year. And they couldn't find anything wrong with them. They couldn't find any abnormalities. I'm not, not saying that'd be suitable for everyone, um, but certainly they took a high level and they, uh, and they, they, for all year, they couldn't find anything wrong with those individuals. So they gave them two grams per kilogram body weight for a whole year and they couldn't find anything wrong. The kidney function was fine. Uh, there was no problem at all. The books that I wrote, um, thanks Mano, I wrote a book called The Insulin Factor. Um, it's also called The Insulin Diet. In fact, let me see if I can grab it uh, because it's published in America as well. Uh, there we go, I've got them. Um, the first one in 2004, the insulin factor, which is then um, published in America called the insulin, the insulin resistance factor. So that's the same book, uh, just different covers. One was the UK and one was America. And then I had that one published, the Food Intolerance Bible. Um, and the, the uh, recipes were created by Antoinette Saville. Um, it's also been translated into Taiwanese, and I, I'm definitely going to show you that one. <clears throat> I'm sure there's a language called Taiwanese. I think it's Mandarin. Um, and so I must show you this. It's, it's, there we go. It's, uh, I have absolutely no understanding whatsoever, any word in the book. And uh, I thought I'd show you that. It's quite fun. Um, there we go, Stephen. So uh, I'm very happy to open up to any questions. Um, da, 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 anything, anything else? I'm, I'm, I'm here to answer your questions. If not, Stephen, any, 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 any other thoughts from you? Very happy to have a conversation with someone if they, if they wish to uh, unmute themselves. So over, over to you. Thank you so much for listening. Can't find on Amazon. Um, maybe because it's so old. Um, and uh, quality of vegetable source protein. Um, I, will, I would look at the branch chain amino acids and ensure they have the, uh, an indication of the essential amino acids um, on it. And generally they will. They'll generally say, you know, full biological value or full essential amino acids. Um, how do I handle, oh, sorry, the question is, how do I handle 15? No, I, I've seen about 19,000 clients. I haven't got them all at one time. Of course, so a slightly misleading comment. I've seen about nine, 18 plus thousand clients over 29 years. And uh, it is sure I have seen a few clients. So thank you so much for your thanks for those of you in the chat. Stephen, um, over to you. Um, what was I supposed to be doing? I, I, I got a call that interfered with my paying attention for about 30 seconds. So, okay, uh, you, you could have you bluffed that completely, but, but thank you for sharing that. And I appreciate you <laughs> take calls. So it's, um, so it's really a question of, um, thank you very much, Steve, for being a host. Thank you so much for answering the questions on chat. Thank you okay. for being a host yeah. again. I wondered Thank if you, you had I wonder if you had any other sort of thoughts or comments because what you've already said is is um is is very useful. So it's great to have you as as um what do I call you the backup team on the pro for uh, the MC. Yeah, I think that the one of the reasons that sarcopenia is such a problem in this day and age is because we're living in the age of inflammation, and inflammation is fundamentally antagonistic to healing and to building muscle. Yeah, yeah. and that the one of the most common earliest signs of inflammation is interference in, in the depth and quality of sleep. And so I think this is a really good thing for people to pay attention to and to use sleep as an aid to strength training exercise. In other words, be willing to do your strength training workout and then arrange your life so you can take a nap afterwards. Yeah, that, that, and that, that takes me back to Joe Wider magazines when I read about Arnie and, and Tom and and, and co the sort of and, and um, Lee Haney and uh, the, the sort of Mr. Olympia or no matter what we think about the drugs they were taking but still the training was pretty impressive and they they deliberately trained and then then slept so uh, if we take the extreme of that but I think I think I agree with you it's actually then managing that I'm going to show you 
um, I'm going to share my screen. I've just got the screen now about um, the mechanisms of, of astaxanthin. So I'm sharing that now for us, just to, just to see. So here's astaxanthin at the top, and it reduces oxidative stress and this lipid peroxidation, which is free radicals affecting the lipids in our tissues. It also reduces myonuclear. So basically, it's the, the, the DNA uh, that then commits cell suicide, apoptosis. So astaxanthin pre presents, pre sorry, reduces how much cell suicide goes on in muscle tissue because oxidative stress increases that. So you can see the various different pathways. Um, some of these are complicated and we, without knowing the special acronyms, it would be difficult to describe them, but phosphorylation of mTOR, the mammalian target of rapamycin, which is directly involved in the muscle protein synthesis stimulus, um, and mitochondrial biogenesis is in there. So really lovely diagram that's, uh, that some research guys have, have put up, but basically supports muscle regeneration um, reduces protein degradation, and therefore prevents sarcopenia. So just a really lovely, a lovely summary of all the complexities. If anyone nerdy wants to know the, the mechanisms, there you have it effectively. So I thought I'd share that um, screen with you. I can send that to you if you want me to, Stephen, so you can you can have that available. Of course, I can send that to you. I'm stopping the share now. I already grabbed it off my, ah. with a screen grab. Yeah. <laughs> See, the tech guy. Okay, so um, very happy to take any any other questions. Thank you so much indeed for hosting me, um, Susan and Stephen. Really appreciate it. Lovely to be back uh, with you um, from over here. Um, and uh, again, any, any other thoughts on sarcopenia muscles? But I'm I'm I, as it happens, you know, this is one of my favourite subjects in a sense. Even though it's not, it doesn't really seem to like how does it feature, but it's just so important to be physically strong. It's just so important. It's not just the capacity to lift something and then pre prevent injury, but it's absolutely vital to reduce morbidity and mortality. Chris, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, Anthony, um, this 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram body weight on the protein recommendation, is that the protein number or the meat amount? No, good question. And you're right. It's the protein content. So it's therefore it's if, if you if a steak is 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 four ounces, you've only got you've only got uh, thirty four grams of protein. Great. So, so it, it is it is the elemental level, if you will, um, of it. protein. It's the protein protein. Good question, Chris. And it's uh, yes. Yeah, so it's it's it is. It, 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 this this may shake up a lot of people saying, well, blimey, how am I going to get that in my diet? It's like. It's, it, is, it is quite challenging. You have to really, really consciously um, ensure that you have the number one important nutrient for human health. So after we breathe oxygen and we drunk water, you need protein. Am I doing the math right for a 178 pound person, pounds now, sorry. Um, yeah. Would that come to about 121 grams of protein? Mm, no, that's a bit high. I'm, I'm doing my math here. 178 divided they, by 2.2. Or is that off? Is um, eight? I've got eighty kilograms. Yeah. Yeah, one seventy. Well, we've got we've we got eighty, and we go times. Let's say one point two. Well, let's not... do the high one because this is for okay, someone sure, with a brain injury. Sure, in which case I think you're correct. Right. So eighty times one point five. It is. Yeah, it is hundred. Correct. Bingo. Okay. One hundred and twenty-one grams of protein. Yep. Per day. That is yep. a lot. <laughs> yes, it is a lot. But you know what? You see, we said it's a lot. It's actually a lot to what we're used to. But in fact. Yeah. Potentially, we got that reference range, and we don't know whether your you specifically need the higher level or the lower level. But it's giving us a range, and it's nowhere near the, the ridiculous dietary arbitrary, which is never designed to be optimal. Let me also add that uh, anybody with a brain injury should be very careful about the uh, potential of excitotoxicity to their um, their recovery. Um, protein has got a lot of MSG in it, um, especially um, meat proteins, animal proteins, and but even vegetable proteins can have high MSG. And so if you have digestive problems and you resort to peptides as a way of augmenting your protein, the MSG content can be released much, much faster than if you're digesting a whole protein and that can produce a higher likelihood of a, of a excitotoxic reaction from the MSG. Mm, yeah, and monosodium glutamate and glutamate and glutamate glutamate is the most abundant of amino acids and it's in protein powders and protein foods the glutamate will typically be the uh, highest level in fact gluten products are also high in glutamate so glutamate is uh, is the most abundant one and it's rare I'm not aware I haven't done this analysis of finding a protein powder with a lower level of glutamate or indeed I actually I haven't and that's one good question I think now I need to get a bit more nerdy and do some more graphs and spreadsheets looking at the lower glutamate protein foods 
Um, and I haven't got the answer for that. Maybe Stephen does, but that's yeah, a good, the lowest, good point. Yeah, the lowest is 10% MSG that's found in collagen protein. When you say MSG, is it, are you talking about glutamate or monosodium glutamate, which is the food well, additive? Well, glutamate. It doesn't, glutamate. I mean, the sodium has no effect on the excitotoxicity. It's yeah. the anion that does it. And yeah. it's, it doesn't matter if it's MSG or glutamate, it's the same mm. reaction. So um, it's just that MSG, when you're buying it as an as a isolated ingredient, is 100% mm. instead of, let's say, 10% uh, in collagen protein and 20 to 35% in meats and other vegetable proteins. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for raising that. It's not, it's not something that I can speak to. It's not something I've, I've observed, but I think it's certainly in terms of brain injury. Yes, um, for sure. Now, then my question, Stephen, is this, which might be useful. Is, that, is there any way of mitigating um, the, uh, the glutamate issues? What can you do to actually address that? So let's say that... Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> sure. I mean, a big part of it is just calcium toxicity. And, yeah. and taking magnesium and vitamin D and vitamin K2 have a huge effect on that. Yeah. And NAC, I understand, helps the NMDA receptor. That's well, what we talked about. Yeah, before. but NAC and is a sulf reduced sulfur compound, which also has its own excitotoxicity risk. Yes, so I it's not just. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the magnesium, magnesium, obviously, because the, uh, it's calcium influx, which is the, 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 yes. the, the cytotoxicity uh, aspect of things. Yeah, yeah. so magnesium. So in fact, in fact um, okay, I've got a new research target now is uh, the evidence of showing magnesium with protein. Maybe there's a magnesium protein ratio, which we need to look at. Hmm. Good idea. Um, I have a question. So um, is there any relationship between the health of your blood, uh, the red blood cells, and um, how well your muscles are working and not becoming so Hmm. Uh, you might need a bit more specific because we talked about high sensitivity C-reactive proteins, so inflammatory uh, cytokines. I, so that, I don't have any specific. I'm just thinking that you know the blood nourishes the muscles and, and gives them the oxygen and so forth. And so, if the blood isn't healthy, then what? Um, in, a, in a typical hematology and biochemistry profile, you have about 30 to 40 different analytes. And so, so in terms of specificity, I would say if one is anemic. And then you're likely to, to have a challenge to deliver the oxygen for the for the energy to occur within the, the the growth process so i say anemia yes and so it's about being specific as to which part of the blood are we talking about and i would say it's certainly anemic anemia gives the gives rise to all kinds of, of problems low thyroid low energy and that might well be a negative factor so it is a, it's a good question um i think the if the albumin and the globulin which talking about the protein if that was low, then there's a potential for less anabolic drive to the protein. The protein is not getting through, even if you're consuming um, sufficient protein orally. And that would then lead to me to consider hydrochloric acid and pancreatic enzymes, potentially. A good question. I think anemia is likely to have a negative factor. I think albumin and globulin and total protein may have a role to play. And certainly if one's got any, a different type of anemia, which is the B12 insufficiency anemia and or folate, then, then the methylation process may be impaired and that's also involved in growth. So I'd say that if, you, if, the, if you've got MCH, which is mean cell, cell hemoglobin, um, and you've got RDW, which is a raised level of red cell distribution width, so indication of a B12 issue. So if we're indications from them that isn't iron related, any type of anemia may well be a factor. So something I haven't really considered before, and I think I've given you uh, an answer. Michelle. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a most informative uh, talk. I have a question actually here. Uh, I'm 60 years old, 5'6", 120 pounds, and I'm very in shape physically. Right. I started to take some uh, magnesium malate, mm -hmm. about uh, 400 milligram at night. It helps me to sleep, but it gives me legs muscle cramps. Mm. Magnesium is often used to prevent muscle cramps, so that's interesting. And the, that's the malate the malate form, um, it can also be useful for the, the, the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle. Um, and um, my, my immediate thought is having experience with, with hundreds and hundreds of clients with cramps is, um, yes, exactly. The, thank you. Uh, well, uh, yeah, Carol. Yeah, low potassium. So actually, I, I would actually look at a calcium, magnesium, potassium. And I, there's a specific mix that I use, which is a, 
which is uh, from a Bartics research called BioCMP. Now C is for calcium, M is for magnesium, and the P isn't, it's, it should be phosphorus, but it's, it's potassium. So I found that to be tremendously useful. To my immediate, uh, thank you, Carol, I would go for that. I would look at potassium and potentially calcium to prevent that uh, along with the magnesium. The calcium magnesium can also help with sleep as well. So I would consider switching to a calcium magnesium formula with potassium. That's been my thought. So right, I agree wonderful. with Carol. Thank you. Great. There's nothing more satisfying than if someone gets cramped every single night and wakes up every single night with that really you have to get up and stand on your foot to squeeze the cramp out. It's so inconvenient um, to actually resolve that just by taking that very inc very inexpensive calcium magnesium potassium mix it's, it's a it's a great thing because it almost always gets to like so electrolytes not just the magnesium so it is intriguing that uh, the previous speaker i'm sorry i didn't see, see who was speaking um who took the magnesium malate um it's, it's, it's intriguing because it might well highlight that potassium is indeed low and, and that you need potassium gate to allow the magnesium to get in the cell so it's curious Okay, no hands raised, no open mics. Oh, we've exhausted, <laughs> we've exhausted them. Um, it, the last question I can see that Charlotte's written, so what, what, um, what proportions of each, you know, uh, I'll tell you, because I've got, I've, got I've got the product here. So I'll tell you the, the formula that I've used for 20 years. Um, I'm not saying it's the, the best form, I've just, I've used it for 20 years and I'll read out the, uh, the ratio just to satisfy that question. By CMP, here we go. I've got, I've just got a little, okay. The, um, it was a ratio of, well, video, potassium was 52 milligrams, 52. The calcium was 18 and the magnesium was only five. Now, typically I bet the calcium magnesium ratio is about three or five to one. So it's, it's more calcium per se. But so when I first saw that, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm not gonna, I need more magnesium. But potassium is richer. So again, I, I appreciate Carol's wise words. But 50, about 50 milligrams of potassium, about 20 milligrams of calcium and five milligrams of magnesium. So it's interesting, it's counterintuitive to my belief that more people need more magnesium, but that ratio works wonderfully. Also is the best ratio I've ever seen for menstrual cramps. So just to share that with you. Okay. I'd uh, also it, add that um, the magnesium and calcium ratio doesn't scale, um, that your body is a, a fairly easy way of dumping magnesium and not so easy for dumping calcium. And that um, the ab ability to tolerate high doses of calcium is severely impaired by having a normal vitamin D level. And so um, be careful that the standard recommendations that people might provide you for uh, calcium of hundreds of milligrams and maybe even a thousand and above milligrams um, become quite toxic in the presence of having a vitamin D level of 40 or 50 nanograms per milliliter yeah. or 100 to 150 nanomoles per liter. Thank you for that. And so I'm pleased to see that the, the level in that particular formula is low. And I have to say, it's probably the only calcium supplement I typically recommend. In fact, I tend not to recommend calcium as a supplement. Okay, we've got uh, uh, admin, um, you have a question? Oh, um, I'm still wondering about uh, using collagen and gelatin products to help the situation. I, I know I'm not gonna substitute what protein is, but uh, is this helping? Good question. Well, I can answer, speak to that a bit of that. So I've looked at some research which shows that um, the glyphosate that's fed, so if animals are fed a, a diet which includes glyphosate, uh, in the feed, it can concentrate in the bones and that can actually then get into the gelatin. So I've heard that as a, as a potential scare, we could put one off gelatin. The gelatin is also, like collagen, is lacking in essential amino acids. So it's not a high biological value protein. Um, it actually misses tryptophan. Tryptophan is not in collagen or in gelatin. And so therefore, um, it may be good for forming connective tissue, maybe helping nails and hair, but doesn't actually help with other proteins. So it won't help with muscle. And if you take one, if you take collagen or gelatin at the same time you're having other proteins, it could be some comp competition in terms of absorption. Also, how much can you take in a day? So uh, I would say that um, taking collagen can be very beneficial. Taking gelatin can be beneficial. I mean, my, my, my mother told me that when she was at, at, uh, in Oxford uh, studying, um, this was a long time ago, she, she and her friends used to eat, 
eat jelly, just jelly, the non-sugar jelly to improve their strength of their nails. So, so it's been used a long time, but I'm not sure that glyphosate was around then. It was, it was introduced basically in 1986, 89, I think. Um, so there is, a, there is a question mark about the source of it. So I would say organic uh, for sure, make sure the feed is organic. Um, as well to make sure you haven't got any glyphosate in, in the gelatin. And I would say that um, if, if you need connective tissue support and collagen can be useful, but I would take it away from other protein sources. But in terms of the adequate adequacy for protein, I'm not sure that you, that you could count the collagen or the gelatin as a protein source if we look at the, the grams per kilogram that you need per day. So it would be in addition to making sure you've got adequate protein. That's my take on it. Stephen has a few, has a view I'm sure that might be, uh, that uh, might be more expensive. Well, a lot of it has to do with the issue of collagen protein turnover rate because uh, the collagen protein and gelatin are optimized for the ratio of amino acids and collagen. It, a lot just depends on how healthy your collagen is. And if you have, for example, let's say cardiovascular disease that is um, the result of low um, vitamin C or uh, copper deficiency, where your collagen isn't fully mature, then you've got this chronic problem of, of, of tissue level inflammation from metallo, uh, matrix metalloproteinases that are constantly turning over this immature collagen as if it was aged collagen. And that's gonna dramatically increase your amino acid needs for collagen protein. So there might be some very specific circumstances like that. And especially if you're possibly through exercise abusing your collagen infrastructure in some way, mm -hmm. which would then require a higher uh, turnover. So you might just consider the collagen protein to be 50% as effective because it's missing um, the essential amino acids that are necessary for muscle protein and for uh, just building tissues in general, other than collagen tissue. Mm. Um, and when I have when Anthony says that mm. the, it's missing tryptophan, that's, it's not just missing tryptophan, it's missing most of the large neutral amino acids, which actually make collagen protein an effective way to deliver tryptophan. If you add tryptophan to collagen protein, you, you spike the tryptophan availability, you, the, the peptides dissolve the tryptophan, and then the absence of the other large neutral amino acids means that the tryptophan gets first, it's in the front of the bus instead of the back of the bus, and it just goes right through the blood-brain barrier. Michelle? Uh, yes, I have an additional question, but I think you may have answered it, Anthony, in your chat. It was the uh, ratios between the potassium, calcium, magnesium of the supplement you mentioned. Yeah, the, 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 the part I just read them out, it was sort of 52 for potassium, it was, tw it was 18 for calcium and five for magnesium, as it happens. But I have used that with hundreds of clients. In fact, a number of colleagues of mine have done it too. And it's, it's actually one of the most, and I use it with my stepdaughter when she gets some menstrual cramps and it works. It just, it just works fantastically for menstrual cramps. So I've used it for muscle cramps uh, as well. I typically recommend an electrolyte concentrate, which is a liquid form, it is true. Um, but I found that particular form. Um, and and you take uh, you take like one caps or whatever. I mean, do you well, take it at night? If yeah, take it at night. And so if, if one tablet doesn't work, take two. So I, I say start on one, go to two, go to three. I haven't had many people take more than three. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. You're yeah, really welcome, Michelle. Thanks for thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay, that's it. That's it. That's it. Fantastic. The end of another fantastically hosted um, presentation. And what a wonderful audience you've been, um, truly. And you've got funny accents, but I managed to translate into in, into English and uh, yeah, some way into British. Saying. Indeed. <laughs> so again, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, I mean, I appreciate we've we've got fantastic number, forty plus people. But if if I believe that if people truly knew how important muscle mass is and, and, and how, how important psychopenia is, we probably have more people. So I hope that people will get to hear about this and then listen to it in the archive. Yes. Okay. Um, I've got one raised hand. Jeff? I don't know if we, do we honor that? 
Well, I mean, I, I'm still I'm recording. Sorry. I was technically trying to do everything and I'm not being very fast. But um, what about this thing? I can't remember who talked about it, but if you get a protein powder with whey base mm. and you put it, it has digestive enzymes and allow it to sit. It's not ferment. It's a different term because you allow it with sort of warm water, about 98 temperature. To digest. Pre-digest. Yeah, allow it to, mm. to pre-digest it. Is that of any use? Or what is the problem? Is is the glutamate still a problem? Yes. Yes. It is. Okay. Anything that you do to pre to speed up the digestion of protein will speed up the release of the glutamate, which is the highest percentage amino acid in um, both animal and vegetable proteins. Huh. Okay. Take so I'm going to use Stephen. So take magnesium with it, and that helps. Huh. Yes. Maybe, okay. maybe not, maybe not lots of magnesium malate if that causes you to have cramps, but certainly <laughs> magnesium. So take magnesium. There are also different forms of magnesium. So it's, it's sort of like there's a, there's a sort of a, a quid quo pro. And if you want to get the best protein for anabolic synthesis, you want the fast proteins. But there's a potential risk that Stephen's highlighted. That I, I learned from Stephen in a previous conversation actually about the potential for glutamate for neurotoxicity. And it's an area that I'm well focused on with regard to Alzheimer's, dementia, and, and, and other neurological uh, disorders is being very careful uh, of the, the glutamate issue. And I share with you, Stephen, that I've got a good friend who happens to do, do her PhD with a large drug company that she's now no longer with uh, on the, on she actually discovered the, the molecular structure of the N-methyl D-aspartate receptor, beta. Oh, cool. Uh, for her PhD, pretty cool. So she, she, she bangs the desk about, oh, watch out for glutamate, glutamate. And then when you made that comment, I'm thinking, gosh, you two, yeah, I've been telling me the same thing, but I wasn't aware of the practicality so much now. Even though I'm a real nerd for protein and amino acids, I, I, I appreciate the glutamate. I've been aware it's the, it's the highest level uh, with all sorts of protein, but in terms of neurotoxicity, so magnesium, so that's well entrenched for me now. I hope that's useful for others as well. Is um, with a protein powder, I'm going to make sure that um, I take magnesium with mine now. Or Wouldn't consume your protein powder organs? slowly over time to mimic the digestion process. No, 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 Stephen. I want to have big muscles as soon as possible. I want to maintain my muscle mass. How can I possibly drink it slowly and then minimize the effect of that anabolic fast protein? Oh, I guess I have to compromise. Yeah. So Fem wouldn't magnesium orotate be what you'd want to do for recovery? There are, I think there are a variety of different magnesiums, to be honest, that would be helpful. Yeah, glycinate, for example, is very lipid soluble, very non-ionic. Okay. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the glycinate form. Yeah. Or bisglycinate. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Thank Rachel. You. Rachel. Yes. Hi. Um, you mentioned the the source of uh, astaxanthin. Um, from the sea, is it a, a kelp or what? Oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's from this, it's from the, the coating of a, of a of lobster. It's the red color of uh, the lobster. So it's oh, um, so, so it's a plant, it's plant, but it's actually found on 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 crustaceans. Now, how they harvest it, I haven't got, I haven't seen the video of how they actually harvest the the astaxanthin. To be honest, maybe Stephen knows more than I do on this. Like he does on many things. Not that Thank one. You. I Not do that know one. that there's a bunch of of carotenoid derivatives that are found in things like flamingo feathers and stuff like that. So there's, you know, yeah. and the station reminds, shells is yeah. a strange. <laughs> yeah, so algae, algae, so the color algae. So there's this lovely, you might be able to find it easily. So for the person is uh, Rachel for the question is the, the, the algae in a certain lake, I think it was Africa, is a very general, the continent of Africa, lake, flamingos on it, the algae gets destroyed by environmental toxins. And then you don't have pink flamingos anymore. You have white flamingos because the algae that's producing the astaxanthin is no longer growing. So that they're white flamingos as a result of the lack of astaxanthin. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, we didn't do a front or hind limb muscle sarcopenic test on those birds, but who knows what's going on with their limb muscle tissue. That would make an interesting PhD study. Oh my God. It would, <laughs> it would, that, that would keep me in Africa for a couple of years. <laughs> Okay. okay. Thank you, Anthony. All right. I'll say farewell. Say good evening to me and enjoy Thank the rest of your you. day, as they say in America. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay. Great being with you. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.